I want to introduce you to Catherine Kalinas Berman and Sophie Kalinas Lamontagne. They are sisters and co-founders of Georgetown Cupcake, stars of the TLC DC Cupcakes and national best-selling authors of The Cupcake Diaries and Sweet, Sweet Celebrations. They work actively with many charitable organizations and, uh, and children's foundations, including Hope for Henry, the Hope for Henry Foundation and the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Please welcome the Cupcake Sisters. Good morning, everyone. Catherine and I are so excited to be here with you today at MCON to share with you our story of building Georgetown Cupcake from just the two of us to bootstrapping it to 300 employees across seven cities uh, across the country. And um, behind us, you can actually see a live stream um, of our bakery in Georgetown, our flagship location. So if you're watching the live stream, this is kind of a meta moment, you're watching a live stream of a live stream. Um, but we're gonna talk to you about the role that that plays in our business today. Uh, Catherine and I don't have a typical entrepreneurial story. We've taken a very unconventional path in starting our company, and today we're gonna talk to you about three things, um, factors that really contributed to the success in scaling our business. The first is passion, the second is connection, and the third is impact. And then we're gonna answer your questions because one of the best ways to learn about entrepreneurship, aside from doing things in the field for yourself, is to ask questions and learn from other entrepreneurs and their experiences. So please, if you're watching online, send us your questions and we're gonna answer them. Like Sophie had, had mentioned, um, we don't typically have the typical entrepreneurial experience, um, but like most entrepreneurs, it did start with a passion for us. And that passion started years and years ago when we were little kids growing up. Our parents and grandparents were both immigrants from Greece, and so when our parents um, went off to work full time, they would drop us off at our grandparents' house who happened to live just down the street like most typical Greek families. Um, and while with our grandmother, we learned how to bake, and she used to bake everything from scratch, um, and it was really our grandmother who had such a huge influence on us as children and inspired us to bake and want to be bakers. But our parents um, dismissed the idea very early on because, as my father said, in our country, people are trying to get out of the bakery and go work for a big company, and you guys are going backwards. And so, um, you know, entrepreneurship wasn't really talked about when we were growing up. Um, and obviously, it existed, but I just think nowadays there's just more awareness about it. And it definitely wasn't um, taught in our school at the time, too. So, Sophie and I were. Um, were told not to pursue that dream at a young age from our parents, and we went off to college. Sophie went to Princeton, studied molecular biology. I ended up going to Marymount University and studied politics. Um, but we still had this love of baking, and we still baked, and we still had this dream that we talked about. And I think it wasn't until 2006, 2007 that we really had this frank conversation between the two of us. You know, are we going to do this or are we just going to always talk about it the rest of our lives? And I think that decision to actually become an entrepreneur is one of the scariest moments in any entrepreneur's life because you're basically giving up, you know, stability, a steady paycheck for uncertainty. You have no idea how it's going to work, how it's going to turn out, um, if you have a viable business. Um, and so it's a terrifying moment. And I think that we had a very frank conversation and we thought, you know what, you know, we don't want to wonder what if our entire lives. And so we took the plunge. Uh, it didn't become real until we signed our first lease um, on a small street in Georgetown. And once you sign that first lease, you're on the hook and, and it becomes very scary because you have to learn how to pay back that rent every month. Um, and it wasn't great timing for us. You know, the challenges had just begun when we signed that first lease because it was 2008, the beginning of the recession, banks weren't lending, um, you know, we couldn't get access to capital, but we had this passion and we weren't gonna let it deter us from our dream. And so we ended up, you know, maxing out our personal credit cards, using whatever life savings that we had, and putting in a ton of sweat equity. You know, we painted the walls ourselves, we installed the counters, um, we spent many nights at the bakery overnight working, um, 
And you know, it's tough. It's a very, being an entrepreneur is not an easy thing. I would be lying if I said, you know, it's all roses, because it's not. You know, there were days where it drove us to our knees or brought us to tears. And I think that, you know, you, you sacrifice a lot of your personal life too, because it's not like a typical nine to five job where you can just leave at the end of the day. You carry this weight on your shoulders um, all the time um, and this huge responsibility but it was our passion that really kind of got us through those moments up to opening day when we first opened our bakery um, in February. And we did everything in the beginning. You know, we didn't have a lot of money, so we didn't have any employees. It was just us two and our mom who came to help. And our customers saw us. They saw us baking. They saw us frosting the cupcakes, packaging them, um, you know, staying to the end of the night, cleaning the entire bakery. And I think our customers, it, uh, they saw that, they saw the passion behind it, and it really resonated with them. And it word quickly spread after that. And so we opened, like Catherine said, in February 2008 on Valentine's Day. Fast forward eight years later, and we've now grown to um, our location here in Georgetown, Bethesda, Soho in New York City, Boston, Los Angeles, Atlanta. We have a shipping facility um, where we ship our cupcakes nationwide near Dulles Airport and um, 300 employees across the country, and we bake on average over 25,000 cupcakes each day. So how did we grow Georgetown Cupcake to this point? There have been a lot of things that have happened over the past eight years to be sure, and hard work has definitely played a huge role, and that can't be understated. But one of the key things that's really helped us scale our company in a way where we still keep that special feeling, that, that feeling of that first single shop in Georgetown that feeling that makes this special, that feeling of smallness. How we've done that is we've been able to connect with our customers on a personal level. And as an entrepreneur, it is critically important to be able to create personal connections with your customers. If you listen to your customers, they will tell you what you need to know. And this sounds very, very simple and kind of common sense, but you'd be surprised at how many entrepreneurs aren't good listeners. Entrepreneurs often have a ton of great ideas and sometimes they think they know everything there is to know about their business and they don't want to hear it from anyone. But it's so important to become a good listener and just ask yourself, are you a good listener? And I, I think, I truly think it's a very, very critical skill and it's a very underrated skill in business. We learned and made one of the best decisions in our business as a result of listening to our customers. When we first started our company, we didn't ship our cupcakes. It wasn't part of our original business plan and uh, maybe a couple months into the business, we start getting calls from customers saying, well, I would like to send cupcakes as a gift to my family in Chicago or to my friends in Texas. And we said, I'm sorry, we don't, we don't do that. We just, you can pick them up in Georgetown and we deliver here in DC and that's it. But people kept calling and asking. And finally, Catherine and I said, you know, we gotta do something about this. We could have easily said, sorry, this is not part of our business plan, but we listened to the feedback. Our customers were telling us what they wanted. And so we decided to make an investment in that. We made a large financial commitment and a large time commitment in developing the packaging, the processes, and the infrastructure to ship our cupcakes nationwide. And we started shipping our cupcakes probably almost two years into our business after we had started. And as of today, we've shipped millions of cupcakes across the country and our shipping business is the fastest growing segment of our business. Another way we connect with our customers is the good old fashioned way, by talking to them. And I think as entrepreneurs, this is really, really important too, because sometimes you can think of your role as sitting behind a desk in an office, and that's not the case. As an entrepreneur, it's so important to be on the ground at your, at your business, at, on the front lines, and keeping your pulse of what's happening at the, at the ground level. And Catherine and I spend a lot of time when we visit our shops in the various cities we're in, working at the front counter working the coffee bar and making lattes, packaging our customers' cupcakes. And sometimes our customers are shocked to see us there eight years later saying, oh, don't you own this place? Why are you doing this? And for us, I'm kind of shocked that they're shocked because as a founder and an owner, we learn so much from our customers by talking to them personally. And it's very important when you build a company to build a great team of um, employees who are great ambassadors from your brand who will be responsible for connecting to your customers on a daily basis. But as an owner and a founder or a CEO, wh whatever your role is at the top, it really does start from the top and you need to spend time talking to your customers personally. When I meet customers in the store, I ask them, where are, they, where are you from? You know, what are you getting? What do you like? What do you don't like? And customers care when companies care about their feedback and their opinions. They take notice, that matters to them. And that's how customers build loyal relationships with companies and long-term brands with companies that they care about. 
Another way we communicate with our customers and connect with them is through social media. And when we started Georgetown Cupcake in 2008, social media was barely on the map. Facebook and Twitter had just started. Instagram, Snapchat did not exist. But now these platforms are key ways that we connect with our cu customers. And as a company, no matter what industry you're in, you need to use technology and um, social media to be able to connect with your customers. And it's, technology is changing every day. How we communicated with our uh, customers eight years ago is different than how we communicate with them today, and it's going to be different eight years from now. And so as you start your company and build it, you need to keep abreast of changes in technology and be able to adapt to them. It's not enough to say, well, I don't understand how to use Snapchat. I don't understand the value. This is the way, the, these are the platforms that millennials and younger generations are using to communicate with each other. And if you want to communicate with them and reach them, you need to embrace them and learn them and also stay on top of changes in technology because it's a key way to c communicate and connect with your customers. And for us, I think um, this Cupcake Cam behind us is one of the most powerful tools we use in connecting with our customers today. This is a 24-7, 24-hour day, seven day a week live feed into our business. We have six cameras placed in various places around our uh, bakery in Georgetown, one on top of the mixer, one um, inside our refrigerator, one of the refrigerators, one on the cupcake racks, one at our fondant making station. This one's um, on our frosting table, and you saw the one on the packing counter. And for our customers, this is the, uh, the ultimate level of transparency in, in business. This is an unfiltered look at what happens at our business every single day. They can, this is, they can see how our product is made in real time from the moment the first eggs are cracked to the moment that pink box is sealed with a sticker and slid across the counter. And um, customers appreciate that. I think people now care about how companies operate how their products are made, how their food is made, and we've given our customers that kind of access. We've allowed them to come inside our business 24-7 and have an intimate, up-close look at how our daily, our daily workings. And you can pop in at 2 in the morning and see what's up. And I think a lot of companies would be kind of uh, afraid of giving that kind of access to customers. But for us, this level of transparency and this authentic look at what we do is something that we love because it enables us to show our customers how much we care about what we do. But, and it's, it's fun to watch as well. But um, that being said, you know, nobody's perfect, no business is perfect. And when you watch our Cupcake Cam live stream, things go wrong all the time. And that, that's authentic, that's part of doing business because nobody's perfect, no business is perfect. But this is real, this is what's happening right now, this is what's happening at this moment. And being real, with your customers is more powerful than being perfect. And I think when you're able to connect with your customers in an authentic way, that helps them develop trust with your brand and also build a loyal relationship. And in addition to connecting with your customers, I think as a company, it's important to can make connections in the communities that you serve and make an impact. And um, no matter what your business model is and whether a social mission is formally part of your business model, it is important to give back and make an impact. And for us, this is actually is one of the most rewarding parts of being an entrepreneur. In our previous jobs, after we graduated from college, I ended up working in venture capital and Catherine worked in the finance industry. And you know, when you're working on long-term projects at your desk, it's sometimes hard to see the tangible impact of your work every single day. But in our line of work, it's very evident, and that's what kind of keeps us going. When a child comes in the bakery and a smile um, you know, lights up on their face, or someone's having a bad day and they come in and you lift their mood, or your cup, our cupcakes are part of someone's uh, wedding proposal or part of a, a couple's you know, 60th wedding anniversary, those kinds of things, being a part of people's special moments in life and having an impact and um, making a difference in it helps us um, get through all the tough work of being an entrepreneur. In addition to kind of making an impact on our customers' lives, making an impact on causes important to us has also been a key part of running our company, and it is one of the most rewarding parts. Um, since we started Georgetown Cupcake, we have had the ability to work with so many amazing um, organizations at the um, national, regional, and local level, and as female entrepreneurs, 
And as a company that employs, um, where our employees are majority female, um, we've chosen to make women and children's issues um, a primary focus for our philanthropic work. So when you start your company, think about what causes are important to you and choose those and, and, and try to make an impact. Um, for us, whether it's you know making a financial contribution to a cause that's important to us, to donating cupcakes to a charity event, to decorating cupcakes with kids in a hospital, those kinds of things are really our favorite part of the job. And I think when we started Georgetown Cupcake, we didn't really think that something as small as a cupcake could make such a large impact on, and a tangible impact on people's lives, but it can. And so um, before Sonia comes back and we answer some of your questions, I just wanna leave you with one thought. If you are an entrepreneur now or, now, or you're thinking about starting a company, dream big and make a difference. Thank you. So to answer one of the questions on here as I'm sitting down, no, they did not bring us cupcakes. <laughs> 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 but that's, you know, you talked about philanthropy and giving back, but being entrepreneur is about making money. So, you know, how do you decide when you're going to give away for free and when you're like, you get a cupcake, you get a cupcake, you know, <laughs> you also want to make some money. So yes. how, do you, how do you make those decisions? Um, the nice thing about um, being an entrepreneur is that um, there really is no red tape involved and mm. it's kind of a liberating feeling when you can make an impact and decision so freely. When we want to make a decision about which charities to give to or what organizations to get involved with, we just talk to each other. We are our board. We don't have any other board members. So in that sense, it's actually kind of cool being your own boss and making your own decisions. But it is, it's, it's, a, it's a choice. Um, obviously, you can't give um, to every worthwhile cause out there. So as a company, like I said, we are a female-owned company. I would probably say 80% of our employees are female at Georgetown Cupcake. And so we, chose, we choose to make women's and children's issues a priority for us. So we try to um, work with those causes. And then how do you say no? It's hard saying no, and, and we, um, you know, I think people are understanding. I think um, we try to do, as a company, we do, a, we actually do a lot, and especially, um, I think for us, um, we, we love, that's one of our most favorite parts of the business. So it is hard to say no, but you know, you do have to draw the line. Okay, let's go to our questions. Most entrepreneurs say that they have to fail at something. What would that be, and what did you learn? Biggest failures. I wonder if they're the same or different for each of you. Um, biggest failures. Ooh, God, there's been so many. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think we always like to call them lessons learned mm -hmm. um, rather than failures. But I think that for us, it's just, you know, it, when we first started, we always wondered when we were going to have this day where nothing goes wrong. And, you know, every day when we first started, there's always something going wrong at one of the bakeries. And, and it, we got really down and it actually um, kind of depressed us for a bit. And we thought, you know what? When is there ever going to be a day where something just doesn't go wrong and we learn that that day doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. And once we learned to accept that, our lives became so much easier to, to deal with. Um, and, you know, there's there's never been a day where something hasn't gone wrong, whether, you know, the, the delivery deliveries didn't go out on time or, you know, the eggs didn't get, you know, delivered to the bakery or there's a pipe that burst or, you know, um, Hurricane Sandy hit and had to shut down our Soho location for an entire week. Um, so I think that, you know, every day there's always something that happens there are many kind of failures every day but it's just learning how to overcome them yeah I think in business you really need to learn to expect the unexpected it's not a question of if something's gonna happen it's a question of when and so like Catherine said the failures happen on so many different levels I mean operational mistakes we've made you know maybe when we started um, we probably didn't build out you know, big enough, or we didn't build a big enough team to get going. Easy looking back. I think as an entrepreneur, it's very um, uh, useful to take periods of introspection. So before you make the next leap or open the next location, think about like what you've done, what you've changed, and take those mo take a beat and take and, and reflect upon what you've done to learn from those mistakes. Be nimble. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Should you say yes to all marketing opportunities, i.e., reality TV? Um, I would say, so for us, the reality television show came about in a very um, unconventional way. Uh, we had a, a customer come into our bakery who was a television producer, and you know he saw us there early on, and he thought that we were just these two crazy sisters. You own this place, but you work here. Your mother's here. You're covered in flour and sugar. And, and he asked to uh, film for the weekend at our bakery. In, at, this is when we were on Potomac Street in Georgetown. Um, and we said, sure, why not? And at the time, we had a lot of GW students, Georgetown students coming in, interviewing us, it ended up on YouTube. So we just thought this one will end up on YouTube too. But <laughs> he actually uh, yeah. took it to TLC and they saw the footage and they picked up the first season of DC Cupcakes. And I think a lot of people, there were a lot of people who said, 
oh, I, I don't think you guys should do a reality show, you know, and, and they try to sort of persuade us not to do it. Um, and, and I think that I'm glad that we didn't listen to those people mm -hmm. because it actually ended up being one of the most uh, rewarding experiences of our lives. And we had no idea what kind of impact it would make, especially on young girls who yeah. watch the show um, and who now and who still send us their business proposals now, who have dreams of opening their own bakeries or whatever business. But um, it, overall, it was a positive experience. And I would always say, um, I, always, I would always err on the side of doing something rather than not doing it yeah. because you'll never know how it's going to turn out. Keep an open mind. Mm -hmm. Did the line start day one when that show aired? Would that, the, the that line? Georgetown cupcake line so around the block? That, that line started actually um, before the show and it was probably, so the first day we opened we had a line mm -hmm. and obviously we would sell out of cupcakes, it was just the two of us and our mother and then we have to shut down, rebake, reopen and it was sort of this like staggered stop and start um, for the first couple of weeks. Um, and there was two things that actually caused uh, the line to grow bigger and bigger over the years. The first was uh, the Washington Post, Walter Nichols was the, the, a food critic there, came in, he wrote a piece on us, and that definitely brought us um, uh, all the regional people coming out, um, coming to the bakery, and the line grew then. Um, it, was, it wasn't until Frank Bruni of the New York Times, um, who was a food critic at the time, who had come into our bakery at Potomac Street, and we had no idea that he had even come. It wasn't until um, someone called to do a fact check mm -hmm. on oh. Georgetown Cupcake that he was going to write something about it. And we were terrified because we didn't know if he was going to say these are good or bad or what he yeah, thought. Yeah, when a fact them. checker calls, you're always like, oh. Yeah, you just don't, <laughs> you don't know. And so, and so we were very nervous, but he wrote this glowing review, and it wasn't until that New York Times piece came out that it, it really gave us foodie cred mm -hmm. and we had people coming in from all over. Mm -hmm. but the idea of you know two sisters who are baking cupcakes and then you go in for you know some seed money did you get a lot of people who are like we get it you're two women making cupcakes I don't really want to you know that's it's too cliche did you have that? No, we actually had, we had um, you know when we went to raise money from the bank um, when we first opened um, it was 2008 so banks were primarily not lending a lot of them didn't believe in our business plan it wasn't that they thought it was cliche that they just they didn't get it and I think um, one of the struggles for female entrepreneurs sometimes is that we tend to um, uh, pursue businesses um, that are um, of interest to females of, of markets that we know need to be served and when males are controlling the financing process, sometimes they don't get these markets. They don't understand companies that cater to females because they're not female. And so that, that was primarily the struggle. But we didn't, we had a lot of people tell us no, but we found a way to get to yes. We could have easily said, that's it. We can't, we don't have any money. Right. People said, we can't afford this, but we found a way to make it happen. And it was not a smart way to start a business. I would not recommend maxing out your credit cards and draining your bank accounts personally to start, put everything on the line, but that's all we could do. And we really wanted to go after this dream. And so you make it work, you make it happen. You find a way to get to yes. How do you ensure quality control as you grow and still separate yourself from everyone else? Um, so, for, for, so for us, you know, obviously we wanted to make uh, cupcakes that were best in class. Mm -hmm. And, you know, surely you can get cupcakes anywhere these days. You can go to the grocery store and get them. And what we wanted to do was use the very best ingredients um, and bake fresh every single day. And you can at see each it location. At, each, at each location. Mm -hmm. And so um, it is almost like putting on a Broadway show every day because you know the curtain must go up and everything's got to be ready and you know things go wrong all the time but um, for us we're very in the weeds at every location we visit we test the cupcakes um, everywhere we go we eat them yeah. um, it's in and it's it ensures that you know the quality stays the same at every location the answer yeah and the answer is scaling a business particularly in the food industry is difficult mm -hmm. and like I said, like trying to scale our company in a way where we don't have this chain feel, where we have still have that special feeling that like, when you walk into Georgetown Cupcake in Soho, you still get that sp same special feeling you do when you walk into the flagship in Georgetown. How do you do that? It's a lot of hard work. It's personally connecting to customers. It's personally connecting to your staff, leading by example, just being involved, being in the weeds. Because as you grow as a company, as a, as a founder, sometimes you feel like, you're so far separated and far removed from what's going on at the ground level. We try to keep our organization very flat. We try to stay in tune with what's going on at the front lines, and that's where when we're at our best, is when we feel like we know what's going on at the ground level. Excellent, thank you so much to Catherine Kalinas Berman and Sophie Kalinas Lamontagne. Thank you so much. Thank you. I like chocolate and peanut butter for, for reference. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.